Not the first. Could we? Oh, that's right. Fine. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Could I say initially how very deeply honoured I am for the felicitation I've just received? I'm deeply touched, particularly because all of those objects have a very special association for me. So they were wonderful choices and I shall treasure them for a long time. Could I also say how wonderful it is to see all of you here? Many of my friends from many, many years, we lost count as Dr. Mukherjee said, but also many new friends whom I've even met today. So thank you all for coming. Could I just ask, can everybody hear me? Is that all right? If you can't, just shout, right. A great responsibility to our public at large. On the 11th of March, 1982, Mrs. Swenerton, who was preparing a lecture for her local Walton and Weybridge Historical Society, wrote to the Royal Institute of British Architects in London. She had lived in Bombay from 1937 to 1954, and she wanted to know whether the Gateway of India was built by Lutyens and its date. The RIBA replied, I have not been able to discover who actually did design the Bombay Gateway but it is not listed in works by Lutyens. Today, I'm glad to say those RIBA letters are in a file which is clearly marked George Whitted. But his two albums of photographs presented to the RIBA by Whitted's son Michael in March 1980, over 40 years ago, have never been photographed. 60 images have now been digitized, especially for this lecture and the museum's centenary, and I'm pleased to be able to give a copy of those on a pen drive to the CSMBS and Dr. Mukherjee today. I'm also honored to present for the first time this research um, in honor of Mrs. Vimal Shah and her memorial lecture. George Whittet worked in India from 1904 until his tragically early death here in Bombay in September 1926. He was just 48. The CSMVS centenary celebrates one of, most, one of Whittet's most renowned buildings, but little work has been done on the 26 years of his life before he arrived in India. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to share a little of the research that I've done on this subject. George Whittet was born at 13 Queen Street, Perth, on the 26th of November, 1878. He would later work in Perth and in Edinburgh. And I know you can't read the map on the screen, but I just thought you'd like to know roughly where we're talking about. Um, You won't have to remember that, but just so you know roughly where we are in Scotland. Right, that's it. It was here at Blair Athol that Helen, or Ellen Smith, aged 26, married Robert Whittet, aged 28, on the 17th of January, 1878. And I have to acknowledge my colleagues, Helen Smales at the National Gallery and the Edinburgh Central Library, for helping in tracking down these genealogical records. The bands of marriage for Ellen and her husband Robert, that's Whittet's parents, signed off by the parish minister at this church in um, James Fraser, recorded Robert's father as John Whittet, carpenter, deceased. That's our Whittet's grandfather, and his mother as Janet Whittet. Ellen Smith's parents, are not recorded, but you see a tombstone here in the churchyard, and these are very probably Ellen Smith's relatives. John Alexander Smith died in 1944, James Smith died in 1978, and Elizabeth Smith died in 1987. I haven't been able to follow up those connections, but it's just one of the many threads that it would be fascinating to follow up. The band said that uh, Ellen Smith lived at Blair Gardens, but nobody in the village of Blair Athol knew where Blair Gardens was. Somebody said that possibly it could be at Old Blair. 
Old Blair is about a mile north of the 19th century planned village, which we know today as Blair Athol. So off I set on the road to find, I'm sorry, um, Old Blair. The reason Blair Athol is uh, well known today is not because of the old schoolhouse, which is its little museum. You can see it even has an old postage, um, postage uh, stamp from 1937. But it's because of Blair Castle, which you see nestled in the hills here, which is the ancestral homes of the Duke of Athol. Right. I said that I set off to try and find old Blair. This is the sort of countryside that Blair's mother was brought up in. Narrow roads, little bridges and steep hills. You'll see at the corner of the right hand side, there's another road branching off. And it seemed to me that that might be Blair Gardens because the, the wall, long wall that you just see on your left of that screen is actually the wall to Blair Castle, which I've just shown you. I hope I can get forward on this. Correct. Right. Um, if you can look very carefully in those slides down that narrow road, you can just see top left the beginnings of a cottage in front of an orangey tree. And looking at it from the other direction on the left hand bottom, you can just see the beginnings of a cottage there. As I said, this road runs along the boundary of the wall of Blair Castle. And the cottage is midway along there, which are private, which is why I didn't actually take them straight on, were made into one cottage in the 1970s by the present owner's grandfather. I met the present owner by chance, and she said, yes, her grandfather had worked in Blair Castle. So I suspect it's quite likely that Ellen Smith of Blair Gardens Cottages lived in one of these cottages at the time of her marriage. At the end of this road is Blair Gardens House, and from there, as you'll see in the slide, a field leads, a path leads through the field, and you can just see, perhaps in the trees, the white outline of Blair Castle, Blair Athol Castle. I show you these pictures because I wonder whether George Whittet, who was not born in Blair Athol but born in Perth, was occasionally taken back to this part of the world to see his, um, where his parents had come from, his grandparents. Um, and years later from India, I just wonder whether he thought of this Scottish landscape where his family had been brought up. How and why, where Robert Whittet met Helen Smith, that's Whittet's parents, I've not yet discovered. But at the time of George Whittet's birth in November 1878, his father's occupation is recorded as clerk at the general prison in Perth, the building you see here. So not a very grand occupation at all. At this time, the Royal Borough of Perth on the banks of the River Tay had a population of about 36,000 people, of whom about 2,000 worked for the enormous North British Dye Works, which had been managed for 50 years by the family of Puller. That's the firm of Pullers of Perth, who were ahead of their time, I'm pleased to say, in building model cottages for their workers not far away. These are photographs of where um, George Whittet was actually born. I'm sorry, I should have said on the previous slide uh, that this is the beginnings of the street, Queen Street, where George Whittet was born, number 39, and I'll show you the building there. That's the building. Um, these are sort of tenement flocks blocks so it's not one house he would have been the, the black door that you see the first black door on the left that's number 39 and that's where uh, Whittet was born. I show it with um, a contemporary interior it's not a real interior it's actually from the Blair Athol Museum but it shows what the interior of a family house might have looked like at about the time Whittet was born although of course the contents here in a museum are many more than would have been in one kitchen. As a clerk at Perth prison Whittet's father must have been very familiar with the darker side of the city of Perth. Sheep stealing, child neglect, and especially the demon drink. Sentences were tough. You got six years penal servitude for burglary, 14 days in jail for stealing a bicycle, fines for rail trespass and reckless cycling. There were some 90 registered drinking establishments in the city, and 
Drunken violence, understandably, was common. The worst problem was apparently drunken females. And also they had a problem with youth crime and gangs. It sounds remarkably contemporary to me, but anyway. <laughs> the Perth Prohibition Society and the Scottish Temperance and Social Reform Association were formed trying to combat combat the demon drink and it's interesting that they took their messages into schools also so even at that stage they were trying to catch the children before they went to drink and in October 1909 the Perth medical officer reported that many poor children undersized and undernourished were coming to school barefoot this is 1909 even in 15 degrees of frost so Whitit was Whitit's background was not a rich background at all when he was 16, George began his architect training or pupillage in Perth in 1894 with the firm of Andrew Granger Heaton, whose initials you see on this building here. At that time, a skilled working class man and his family would pay nine pounds a year for a four room flat or tenement comparable to 39 Queen Street where Whitted lived. And as these substantial buildings testify, for the middle classes, Perth was a fine city with rowing, cricket, pigeon racing clubs, the Perthshire Football League founded in 1884, the Perth Theatre and the Perth Musical Society. The Heaton firm designed the council offices in 1881 and rebuilt them after a fire had burned them down. The rebuild in 1895 you see here. And that was the year after Whitted joined Heaton's office, so he must have been um, involved and in working with these buildings. Opposite the building, at the end of South Street, flows the River Tay, the river that Perth is situated on. In Whitted's day, there were street traders everywhere, many of them children, with horses and ponies pulling large carts and small grocery vans. The Motor Act, licensing cars and trams, was not passed until 1903, that's the year before Whitted went to India. It included a speed restriction in the city. Cars and trams were restricted to 10 miles an hour. <laughs> Next to Heaton's new build of the council offices, Whitted would have noticed the remains of 17th century buildings which still survive in Perth. You'll also notice the Gothic style detailing of the council offices. Heaton attended the prestigious Fetis College in Edinburgh, and you will see shortly that his college years and the building may have left their Gothic impression on him. A short walk up Watergate led to George Street with Heaton's office at number 72, where Whitted would also have worked. Heaton's private residence was a house called Daywick, almost opposite the council building, but on the other side of the River Tay, which we saw just now and Whitted must surely have visited this house. Heaton's tombstone, he died in June 1927, is in the Greyfriars Kirkyard near the council offices. Neglect has now branded many of the stones unsafe. If any of them show the slightest signs of wobbling, the council just knock them over in case they fall over and hurt somebody. And unfortunately, Heaton's own memorial is one of these branded unsafe but you'll notice it has Anglo-Saxon inter interlaced decoration on it, very Scottish design. In 1898, Whitted went to Edinburgh to, to continue his pupillage with the firm of Dick Peddy, later Peddy and Washington Brown. The firm's office was number eight, Albin Street, in the new town, that's the black door you see here. Um, and I also show, in addition to the view of Albin Street, a rather poor image, I'm very sorry about that, but it's of a contemporary typewriter, the sort of thing you would have found in Whitted's office. And I know that some of our audience are quite interested in typewriters, um, hence introducing this. It's the Williams Number no. 2, and it was brought in 1902 by the Inverness architectural firm of Thomas Munro and Co., who are very interesting in their own right, because they were 100 years and more in the same building, the same family, and even the same furniture, hence this typewriter. Now, all, the Auburn Street office is just north of Robert Adams Charlotte Square, which you may have uh, heard of, built in 1814, one of the beautiful central classical squares of Edinburgh. Oops, 
sorry. In the Edinburgh census records, Whitted, his mother and a tenant, are recorded as the occupants of 39 Cumley Bank Avenue in Edinburgh. You see just on the top left, you might be able to see the sign at the beginning of the road, which slopes s steeply downhill. And number 39 front door is the one with all the dustbins in front of it. I'm sorry, but that's what it looks like today. Um, I mentioned that it was his mother and a tenant who lived there. And I wonder whether perhaps Whitted's father had died by this time and the family had moved to Edinburgh, where his mother took a tenant to help make ends meet, or whether there was some other issue in the family which meant that Whitted's father and mother didn't both move to Edinburgh. Another thread that we've got to follow up. From here, I'm going to trace Whitted's walk from 39 Cumley Bank to his office in Auburn Street, pointing out some of the buildings which Peddies, and thus Whitted, who worked with them, would have worked on during his Edinburgh period from 1898 to 1902. At the top of Cumley Bank Avenue, he could look back to Fetty's College, which Andrew Heaton had attended. Remember I mentioned that Gothic detail in the council offices? Well, Fetty's, an absolutely splendid college in Edinburgh, uh, was built to emulate those marvellous medieval Gothic town halls in Belgium and France. And it's one of the most famous schools in Edinburgh today. The building on the lower right, I shall refer to later, but it's just in contrast. This is the Edinburgh Academy. And you'll see that the background that Whitted could pick up in Edinburgh went from Gothic to classical quite easily. Just on, He didn't pass the academy on the way to work, but he, it was not very far away. Returning to Whitted's path to work, he would have crossed the Dean Village Bridge, built in 1832 by the famous railway engineer Thomas Telford. And you can just see, perhaps over the houses, that he's looking towards the dome of St George's Church, um, which is now West Register House, built in 1811 at the west axis of Charlotte Square that we were looking at. Beyond that dome is the Charlotte Square that I showed you earlier. At the far end of the bridge, on the left, the houses are called Randolph Cliff because they're very steeply um, overhung over the water of Leith. And Washington Brown, Petty's business partner, had a flat here. And on the right at the end of the bridge is Line Dock Place, where Peddies, and thus Whitted, worked at number 15 in 1902. At the top of the hill, Whitted could have taken an alternative route and turned left instead of right, and he'd have found himself at Ann Street. This is an elegant terrace, begun in 1814, and it's the first of the houses in Edinburgh Newtown to have gardens in front, not gardens at the back. And you'll notice the severely classical elements in some of the buildings. Again, Whitted would have walked past these buildings on his way to work. At the end of Anne Street, the path, the road went steeply down the hill. Anne Street comes in at the top right of that uh, building on the left. He would have passed number 50, which is where the Bannerman family lived. You may remember those wonderful illustrated um, letters of the Bannerman family from Bombay to Edinburgh. The top of this hill here, number 50, is where those letters would have been arriving every week from Bombay. On down the hill and a little downstream from the Telford Bridge, an area called Stockbridge, which it would cross the water of Leith. That's the small stream which throws through the centre of Edinburgh to its port out at Leith. And this is the little footbridge um, across the river there. Edinburgh is quite a hilly city, and going through Stockbridge, uh, which it would have turned up past the old house in India Place, another reference to follow up, which is inscribed and dated 1605, and where the artist David Roberts lived. And then finally, up Gloucester Lane to Alban Street at the top, following the old route that the cattle took over the Stockbridge, hence Stockbridge, to market in the town centre. Petty's workbook during Wicket's time with them is focused on the squares and terraces of the Edinburgh Newtown, some of which you see here, Murray Place and Randolph Place. It was mainly alterations and improvements. Obviously, the houses were well and truly built, but Petty's seems to have been a firm that was called in, presumably, if somebody moved or they wanted an extension, or in one occasion, 
he seems to have worked on about four houses joined together in one street. He all, the firm also worked on the slightly later 19th century terraces. I show you here at the top, Drumshuch and Walker Street. Um, Pedis did work in places other than Edinburgh. They worked down in the borders, but this was largely, um, as we can see from their workbooks, after Whitted had left them to go and work with the firm of Briarleys in York. Some of the buildings Pedis worked on in Prince's Street and North Castle Street are now partly converted into commercial premises. Whitted, I'm afraid, would hardly have recognised them. Sorry, I'm going, oops. Right. In 1901, aged just 23, Whitted had already won the Honorary President's Prize for three designs submitted to the Royal Institute of British Architects. In that same year, 1901, John Begg was appointed consulting architect to the government of Bombay. And when he was home on leave in 1904, John Begg, whom you see here, interviewed Whitted for the post of his assistant in Bombay. Begg may also have known Whitted via his cousin, John Whitted, who was studying architecture with the Ed Edinburgh firm of Hippolyte Blanc at the same time as Begg was studying with them slightly earlier. The story is well known of how Begg, on leave from India, interviewed Whitted on the railway platform at York. You remember Whitted had left Edinburgh and gone to work with the firm of Art Briarleys at York. He was interviewing the young and talented Whitted for the post of Begg's assistant in Bombay. Begg was um, consultant architect to the government of Bombay at the time. Begg's wife advised him, do not appoint that young man. He will boss you around. <laughs> but Begg, maybe quite sensibly and certainly sensibly for the CSMVS, didn't listen to his wife and the appointment went ahead and Whitted joined Begg in India in 1904. John Begg was the third son of an ironmaster in Bowness in Scotland, another of those Scots helping Scots equations. And it was Edinburgh Academy. Do you remember that classical building that I showed you in contrast to the Gothic fetties? John Begg uh, attended the Edinburgh Academy, that classical building. It's so severely classical, it even has a Greek inscription over its entrance door. Begg's appointment in Bombay, as I'm sure you well know, would challenge and change the prevailing Gothic revival style. And his GPO building, which you see here, was the design which broke that mould. Whitted was initially not impressed. Why that stuff? He demanded. Why didn't he design a good Renaissance building? <laughs> Sorry. At the beginning of the 20th century, architects were beginning to assert their rights to control both the design and the construction of buildings, not just the exterior design. This became a public issue via debates in periodicals like The Builder about the education and training of architects and the skills required to trans translate knowledge on paper into practice. Begg was also keen to promote recognition for the architect abroad. The architect in India should not only speak, but also think architecture in an, in an indigenous manner, he said. Then, and only then, will his architecture become sound, modern, and vital. Surely it is not the government, but more particularly the nation itself, which should supply a national art, Beg declared, and don't stop short with enthusiasm. I show you here, um, what you might think was the interior of the CSMBS. This is one of the photographs from the album that I mentioned that belonged to Begg's wife, uh, Blanche Sauer, and was given by her to her son Michael and was given by Michael, Michael to the RIBA. This is actually, all his photographs are labelled and this is labelled interior of the GPO building. And I think it looks so similar uh, but one of your colleagues said that it hasn't got enough layers on it to be the CSMBS. Um, Begg's involvement, by this time he was uh, wished to take over in Bombay as uh, consultant architect, 
and Begg had been promoted to consultant architect for the government of India, so he was off in Simla a lot of the time. His involvement with the competition for designing New Delhi did not gain him favour with Lord Curzon. There was a bit of uh, um, underhand operation, I think. Um, so the consulting architect to the government of India, John Begg, returned to Scotland without any awards or any honours, but he did begin a very important second career, establishing the Edinburgh College of Art and Architecture as an academic and vitally relevant discipline. He died in 1937, and he's buried in the Grange Churchyard in Edinburgh, and you see his uh, tomb here with that of his wife. Thank you. Uh, these amazing photographs uh, are from Sanderson, Types of Modern Indian Buildings, 1913. You'll easily recognize the difference between these and the Witted album because the Sanderson ones have got inscriptions underneath. Um, but I show them because one of the aspects of building that Begg and Whitted championed was respect for the native craftsmen and a craft tradition that had gone on for hundreds and thousands of years and was still living today. It might need direction, it might need support, but it was still a living craft. And I thought these photographs um, very well illustrated it, particularly the one on the right, which shows making models, uh, making clay models for um, decorative features. Kipling declared that not a single draftsman emerged from the government draftsman school at Roorkee with any knowledge of Indian architecture at all. Many now earning large sums of money, said Kipling, are mere copyists and tracers. Begg, therefore, established a technical draftsmanship course here in Bombay, and Whitted developed this further into a four-year architectural course, which he taught at the JJ School of Art, which was then known as the Architectural Students Association from 1908. He also designed the technical building of the school, and many of the first generation of his graduates became the nucleus of the Indian Institute of Architects, of which Whitted was president from 1917 to 1920. Begg believed that individuals should make a thorough search for, quote, the universal principles that would result in a modern building which expressed a living tradition. I show here another one of Sanderson's photographs. This is an interior from Bikaneer, and you can see how difficult it would be for an architect, for a building to look a, a unit if the architect designed the outside and took no thought for how the decoration of the inside would go. I show this for contrast with a photograph of the Port Authority building at Karachi, which Whitted designed. I'm not showing many of his designs outside Bombay, but this was one of them. And I'm absolutely sure that with Whitted's background and principles, the inside of the building and the outside of the building were both absolutely fit for purpose, adopting that much more holistic approach, which Begg and um, Whitted advocated. And why, on the right, the sudden flashback to one of those classical facades in Anne Street in Edinburgh? Looking at the profile of where the vertical meets the horizontal at Karachi, is there possibly a glimmer of a reference to the articulation of the ground level of this facade in Edinburgh, which Whitted would have passed on his way to work all those years ago? Please turn. Right, thank you. Whitted and Begg not only advanced the teaching of architecture, they designed the buildings where education was pursued. Here you see Whitted's plan, which is signed for the Science Institute, and photos from his album of the Science Lecture Theatre and the Chemistry Lab of Grant Medical College. They're wonderful photographs in their own right, actually. Um, here, the Art College. Oh, the apertures, which you see in the detail on the right particularly well, the apertures were designed to allow air to circulate into the building. They had to be adapted after it was found that during examinations, students outside the building 
were using these openings to pass information to their fellow students inside the building. Um, Beg and Whitted were directing their teaching towards a future for India. And remember, this is round about 1911, you know, 1914, well before independence. As Beg pronounced, India has hardly begun to develop a modern architecture. She possesses, on the other hand, another heritage, a unique and wonderful thing, a still living style tradition. There were responsibilities too, however. Beg said, he who pays the piper, Beg's a Scot, remember, he who pays the piper has the right to call the tune. It is a mistake, however, to call a tune which any particular piper cannot or does not wish to play. Who pays the piper also has the responsibility of seeing he gets the piper who can best play the tune he wants. But you have no right to coerce or impose on the craftsman. The building at the bottom, I wasn't quite sure where to put this. It's the Royal Institute, which you're supposed to be looking at as an architectural building. But I showed it because there's a game of tennis going on at the back, and it's the only game of tennis in Whittet's album. But it suggests that he also played tennis while he was in Bombay. <laughs> Kipling and Kumaraswamy had deplored the work of the PWD, the Public Works Department, the architecture of railways, cantonments, irrigation, monotonous straight lines, ugly and imposing, but with a heavy hand of authority and prestige. Begg and Whitted would recreate and reinterpret what one author, contemporary author, has termed the historical rescue of Indian styles and vocabularies. And you see some examples here in the Sassoon Hospital, this is Pune, uh, the house for F.E. Dinshaw and an un unidentified house, although if you look, you, you can look carefully in the photograph, there are the initials G.T. on the veranda, and that must surely have stood for the Tata family. This is a um, photograph dated 1910. This is very familiar territory. You'll know these photographs, but I included them just to show you that which it also chose to include them in his own album. You can see the huge scaffolding on the dome and the area around the building um, in his time. This would be sort of 1914-ish. Um, next one. Although Whitted had to alter his original museum designs so that they were more direct, so that they more directly complemented Begg's GPO building, Whitted's design, as Begg himself described, Gave, it a new, gave a new lease of life to the living tradition of Indian craftsmanship after it had fallen into a rather feeble state of vitality. In 1915, Begg, that's the year after um, the work here was going on, Begg submitted the proposal for Whitted to become a fellow, not just a member, of the Royal Institute of British Architects. The proposer's statement, which you see on the left, states that Begg's acquaintance with Whitted began in 1904, lists his education, and among the candidate's work, Begg describes the Prince of Wales Museum of Bombay as, quote, an excellent example of the able adaptation of indigenous treatment and methods to modern conditions. The sources are Bijapur, Ahmedabad, Champanir, but the treatment is entirely Mr. Whitted. In his statement on the right-hand side, Whitted, the candidate, also had to list his education and the buildings he'd worked on, but it's interesting that he mentions he'd traveled in France, Egypt, Ceylon, and India, and it will be really interesting to learn more about what he took note of in those countries that he visited. Whitted signs this as a true statement with his age, just 30 years old. Um, as you know, um, the Prince of Wales Museum started life as a hospital, uh, and you see a photograph of it from Whitted's album here. His output in India is truly remarkable. In the year 1914, that's the year war broke out, his firm was dealing with no less than 64 buildings, 
and his final output would be 95 major projects for the government of Bombay and a further 44 for the Tata family. As I said, his museum building first saw service as a hospital for the war wounded, and which it must have heard the news from Perth, where the Black Watch were the first regiment to leave for France in 1914. The sixth, the first Black Watch and a thousand second Black Watch reserves were all in France by the 19th of August. By October, 60 troop trains were passing through Perth every single day. Cameronians, Canadians, Seaforth Highlanders. Whitted designed these regimental memorials in St. Thomas's Cathedral to commemorate those who had made the supreme sacrifice in the Indian regiments, the Bombay Light Horse, the number three Sea Engineers, the Bombay Battalion and Cavalry, the fourth B Group Garrison Artillery with two military crosses awarded, and to Eric Stewart Douglas, the Victoria Cross, the highest award for valor um, in our country. Not surprisingly, perhaps, the design inspiration for Whitted's War Memorial Cross in St. Thomas's Cathedral is not Gothic or Indo-Saracenic, but Celtic interface. And he must surely have been speaking, thinking very much of his colleagues in Scotland at this time. The last of his war memorials returns to the classic tradition to commemorate somebody called C.R. Hoskins. And I'm very sorry, I have omitted to put C.R. Hoskins' biography in my notes. So I, if anybody's interested, I'll give it to you afterwards. Uh, my apologies. Ah. Right. Continuing the ecclesiastical theme, in the middle you see a watercolour in Whittet's album, a watercolour by Whittet himself of a design for a pulpit. And I found this particularly interesting because when Whittet was articled to Pedis, the architectural firm in Edinburgh years earlier, one of Pedis' commissions was to design the pulpit and the organ case for the Palmerston Place Presbyterian Church, where, as you can see, they remain in use today. It's actually just round the corner from where I live, so I was delighted to think which it might have had something to do with the building so close to me. The heavier furniture in these photographs might look rather ecclesiastical, but it's in fact a commission which Whitted received for Government House Council Hall in Pune. In the Renaissance style, in the, to the order of the Government of Bombay, on the 19th of April, 1912, Whittet wrote to the firm of E. Wimbridge & Co, who had executed his designs. Dear Sirs, I wish to express to you my satisfaction with the workmanship throughout, especially the carvings, which have fully realized my ideas, and I congratulate you upon the result. In the Durbar souvenir leaflet, which they produced, a copy of which is pasted into Whittet's album, Wimbridge & Co. of Queen's Road, Pune, described themselves as carpet importers, blind specialists, agents for Burroughs and Watts Limited, and list the medals they had received, a gold in the Paris exhibition of 1886, and others in London, Allahabad, and Bombay. So Whitted obviously knew he was going to very talented craftsmen when he commissioned them to do this work. Good. Also illustrated in this album is this impressive casket, described as a Parsi casket. I haven't been able to find out more about it, but it's certainly a splendid piece of silverware. And I provide some context for where such an object, not necessarily this one, but such an object might well have been displayed. These are interior photographs from Whitted's album of Bombay Government House, the drawing room and the dining room at the time he would have known them. Here you see um, the banqueting hall of Government House, the entrance portico and portico, and on the lower left, the really impressive uh, dog kennels. You'll see that Whitted didn't abandon the classical vocabulary um, when he had created the CSMBS building, and he used it in these buildings that you see here. The banqueting hall is detached and initially that was for the very practical purpose of protecting the main house from fire. And it was a familiar concept, as I'm sure you know, in British stately homes of the 17th and earlier 18th century. And Whitted would have known a fine example of these separated banqueting halls from William and John Adams' magnificent Hopeton House 
on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Um, on the left-hand side is the uh, banqueting hall, and on the right-hand side was actually a library building. They are actually joined by a colonnade, but it's an, but it's an empty colonnade. But Whitted would most certainly have known this magnificent building in Edinburgh, and I thought it was interesting to show it just as a, an example of a detached banqueting hall. More very familiar photographs, but again, I show them because they were the photographs that Whitted posted into his album. Uh, the gateway itself, and the procession moving up towards the centre with um, the gateway behind. Some of the other photographs of the gateway um, remind one of the very long history of the triumphal arch, but I chose these photographs because they seem to suggest also the very ephemeral nature of these celebratory arches. Um, I show also, in the corner here, next to the arch garlanded with flowers, um, which is from the Staple Company, greetings, the Royal Arch in Dundee. This was constructed to commemorate the royal visit of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert to in 1854 to Dundee on the way up to their Highland home in Balmoral. It's a splendid uh, triumphal arch, and it stood in Dundee on the waterfront until the 1960s when it was demolished to make way for the new Tay Bridge and coastal roads and concrete. It somehow reminded me of another city that's busy demolishing its coastline for coastal roads and concrete, but that's to be aside. Here are their, here are their majesties, the final garnish to all the preparations and a rather interesting back view of the carpet looking up towards the center of the city, which I'm sure you'll recognize. As I say, I know these are very familiar, but I think it's interesting to know that Whitted too wanted to have them in his album. I mentioned tennis, but with such a demanding professional program, did Whitted ever have a chance to take a holiday? This watercolor, with its own painting inscribed by him, Uta Kamund, confirms that he did sometimes take to the hills, where the unusual shapes of two trees obviously attracted his designer's eye. Also for relaxation, Whitted was welcomed to Bombay society pretty well as soon as he arrived, and he's seen here at the Gymkhana of 1906, another photograph from the album, and also at a St Andrew's night dinner, which has unfortunately not dated. You'll remember from the Bannerman letters that the Scots in India celebrated St. Andrew's Night, that's normally the 30th of November, near enough, with all possible tradition. The doctor, Dr. Bannerman, had written back to his daughters in Edinburgh to please send him not the, nor the standard pink heather, but please to find some white heather so could th that he could wear it in his buttonhole in November. The first St. Andrew's Night reported in Bombay was in 1898, partly because loyalties to the long-established Grand Lodge of all Scottish Freemasons held back the development of the Caledonian Society's own celebration. There was a Burns concert in Bombay in January 1899, and the Madras Mail of the 2nd of December 1901 reported a St Andrew's concert with the Scotch Kirk Choir, reels, pipers singing Old Lang Syne, thistles and Scottish flags, all came to the fore. Haggis and Heather came from Scotland. There were telegrams from home, and any Scottish regiments posted nearby provided rousing music. These were also, however, occasions for the Scots to renew business acquaintances. Wives and women were not invited. There were elaborate speeches, alluding to rather romanticized, or by that time possibly well fueled with drink, whiskey, view of Scottish history and heritage. In 1893, for example, the toast in Calcutta extolled Scottish values, I quote, as the same dear old love of sincerity and independence and thrift and prudence and robust common sense. A lasting reminder of those very strong Bombay Scot associations is the statue of Robert Burns, which stands today in the Scottish National Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh, and which I've shown here before. As you'll remember, the plinth is inscribed that the statue was produced by subscription raised by the people of Bombay. Sadly, 
Wichit himself was not one of those particularly robust individuals toasted in the Calcutta speech. And as you know, he died here in Bombay on the 10th of September, 1926. The arresting image from his album, the last one of these photographs I'm going to show, seems to incorporate all the inspiration, the promise, and the movement forward into the future, which we now associate with Wittit. A century later, Wittit's inspiration, that great responsibility to all our publics, to all our publics, has been carried forward with great conviction and success by Dr. Mukherjee, by the museum trustees past and present, and I'm honored to remember Mrs. Vimal Shah in this respect, by Dr. Feroza Godrej, and by all the friends of the Museum Society, and indeed by all of you here tonight. It's a very real privilege to be able to share the centenary celebrations with you. But I would like to leave the last word to George Whitted. This view, familiar to you all, is one of only three watercolours in his album by George Whitted himself. It also gives us a rare glimpse of an aspect of George Whitted's life about which we still know very little. A quiet, private moment for the architect, away from his responsibilities, away from his public, a Scotsman in Bombay a hundred years ago. Thank you very much.